Hello and welcome to another edition of The Bastard Review. This time around I'm looking at NWA's Chi-Town Rumble. This event took place on February 20th, 1989 at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago, Illinois. Our first match of the night sees Freebird Michael Hayes take on the Russian Assassin number 1 in a pretty basic by the numbers match. Michael starts off strong with a headlock then moves on to multiple arm bars. It's slow and methodical with small bursts of energy by both men, and for a match with no story, it's giving a surprisingly a decent amount of time. I probably wouldn't have opened my show with this match though, it would have worked better as the second match. I'm giving this a 5 out of 10. Afterwards, Ricky Steamboat cuts a pretty no-nonsense promo concerning his title match later on the night. Then Sting cuts a short promo prior to taking on Butch Reed in singles competition. To go from challenging for the World Tag Team titles to having a non-title match against a newcomer to the NWA, regardless of Reed being a veteran of Mid-South Wrestling, feels like a step down for Sting, and this feels like a hastily thrown together match from the get-go. Fortunately, both men work well together, and there are moments that flow pretty well. If anything, the match suffers from being given too much time, 20 minutes. It would have worked better as a quick paced 10 to 15 minute match. The NC Sting beat Butch with a roll up, the outcome of which I had no doubt. I'm giving this a 5 out of 10. Paulie dangerously cuts a promo about bringing in Jack Victory as Dennis Condry's replacement, who Paul sent on vacation, but in reality had left the NWA just days earlier. Jack teams up with Randy Rose in a rematch of sorts against Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton, only this time, Paulie and Jim Cornette would be included in the match to make it a six-man tag. In addition, the man who gets pinned must leave the NWA. Much like the match at Starcade, this was fun to watch. Rose and Jack dominate most of the time with Stan taking a tremendous amount of punishment. I really enjoy the interaction between Jim and Paul. I honestly think they work very well together even if they don't get along in real life. I cheer along with the crowd as Jim's Midnight Express come out on top, and I'm giving this a 6 out of 10. After that, Rick Steiner defends his NWA World TV title against the man he beat for it, Mike Rotunda. I'm not a fan of Steiner's gimmick here. He was in a car accident a while back, and since then he's suffered brain damage resulting in him talking to his hand that he's named Alex. It's a hokey gimmick that doesn't suit Rick at all, and I really don't know why the bookers thought it was a good idea. The match is pretty similar to the one at Starcade, slow going, and just lacking that oomph to get me into it. Towards the end, Kevin Sullivan comes down, gets on the mic, and talks about Rick's pet dog that's backstage, as though he might do something to it. It's an obvious ploy to get Rick to intentionally lose via countout. But it doesn't really make sense because Rick's brother Scott has come down to ringside with him. It's just a stupid moment that adds nothing to the match. The end sees Mike regain the title when Rick has him in a sleeper hold and falls backwards to lock it in but puts both shoulders on the mat, in essence pinning himself. It's a less than ideal way to end what is already a ho-hum title match. I'm giving this a 5 out of 10. Up next is a match that's been a few months in the making. Barry Windham defends his NWA US Heavyweight title against his former tag team partner Lex Luger. Months prior, when Lex had left the Horsemen, he teamed up with Barry to take on Horsemen Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson and won the tag team titles. Then, just weeks afterwards, when defending them in a rematch, Barry turned on Luger and joined the Horsemen. Finally, Lex would get some revenge here tonight. The match starts off strong, with Lex in control. About midway through, Barry goes to punch Lex outside of the ring, but Luger moves out of the way and Wyndham's fist connects with one of the turnbuckles. For the rest of the match, Barry does a really good job of selling this injury. The end sees Lex win the title when Barry gives him a belly-to-back suplex into a pin, but Lex gets his shoulder up while Barry does not. Yeah, another fluke win, 
and a pretty weak win for Luger, who had just vied for the world title a few months back. I suppose it wouldn't be so bad if this wasn't the second one in a row. I'm giving this a 6 out of 10. After that, the Road Warriors defend their NWA World Tag Team titles against the Varsity Club of Kevin Sullivan and Dr. Death Steve Williams. And I have to question what the bookers were thinking pitting the World Tag Team Champs against the U.S. Tag Team Champs in a non-unification match. You know, if you're not going to unify them, why do it? Otherwise, it's a pretty fun match. Watching each team try to out-cheat the other was really amusing. I'm surprised at how short this is, though. It clocks in at almost eight and a half minutes. It's too quick of a match that really never gives me enough time to invest in it and get really excited over the outcome. Hawk and Animal manage to get in one tag team maneuver, but otherwise it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Yet again, there's another hokey ending where Animal covers Sullivan and Williams covers Hawk, but Animal and Kevin are the legal men and thus the Road Warriors retain. Can we just get a clean pin in a title match, please? I'm giving this a 5 out of 10. Finally, we come to the main event. Ric Flair defends his NWA World Heavyweight title against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Ricky had returned to the NWA in January as a surprise tag team partner of Eddie Gilbert against Rick and Barry Windham. Ricky pinned Flair and immediately garnered the title match tonight. The story going into this is that Ricky is the family man while Flair is the polar opposite, a whining, dining ladies' man, and Rick has to prove that he is the better man. Wow! Now this is a phenomenal title match. Both men do a brilliant job of pulling you into it and getting both the audience and viewer riled up. About 10 minutes in, Ricky Irish whips Rick into a turnbuckle as Rick goes tumbling over it but lands on his feet. He runs the length of the outside mat, climbs another turnbuckle, and dives onto Ricky with a flying crossbody, but Steamboat rolls with the fall into a pin and gets a two count on Flair. Then Rick manages to get in a figure four leg lock and plays up the heel persona, grabbing the ropes to use his leverage when the ref isn't looking, and then letting him go when the ref glances over. The end? Well, I could tell you how it ends, but this is a match definitely worth watching, and far be it from me to spoil it for you. Suffice it to say, it is worth your time. I am giving this a 10 out of 10. Overall, the Chi Town Rumble is a barely above average pay per view. Honestly, if you watch it for anything, it's the main event and little else. And that's a shame because there's a lot of potential here that's just squandered. Matches that are given too much time, not enough time, are just too slow paced when they should be frenetic, or just have silly endings. I just expected better. I'm giving this a 6 out of 10. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again to another Best of Review when I review another wrestling DVD in my collection or anything else that crosses my path.